Hey YouTube, welcome back. In today's video, we are going to discuss the Hebrew scriptures as a microcosm of ancient Near Eastern life and history. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to ask you to please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. In order to discuss the Hebrew scriptures as a microcosm of ancient Near Eastern life and history, I'm first going to need to define microcosm. Microcosm is defined as a community, place, or situation regarded as encapsulating in miniature the characteristic qualities or features of something much larger. That was a very, very fancy way of basically just saying that I'm going to discuss how the Bible gives us a glimpse into the culture and customs of Israel and her neighbors during the time period in which the Bible was written. You know, the Old Testament books are packed full of sagas, poems, true historical narratives, genealogical lists, legal rules, etc. The real events that the Bible describes gives us a glimpse into the heart cries and daily lives of the people that it describes. History for the surrounding cultures of Israel, the pagan cultures, included a lot of mythical beliefs, whereas Israeli history is based on actual events and facts or true narratives. As the covenant people, this makes sense to me. Israel was being used mightily by the one true God to get his message out to the world so that it could ultimately get to you and me. Sure, there may have been some facts mixed in with the mix, mixed in. Okay, let me start that sentence again. Sure, there may have been some facts mixed in with the mythological beliefs in the surrounding culture that came down from their ancestors, but the Hebrews had pure, unadulterated truth that was given to them by God directly. There were flood stories in the surrounding culture, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, but the biblical account of Noah's flood, the Hebrew version, is the true narrative of the worldwide flood. The Hebrew idea of history is completely theological. God is the main event in the Bible, which includes the history written about his covenant people. The question is, what was life like for them? That is answered very simply by reading through the Old Testament. We can take a journey through time with Israel when they were, in, when they were actually enslaved in Egypt, when God let them out of Egypt, when Israel was wandering through the desert, when Israel was going into the promised land and enjoying God's blessing, and then Israel's heart would turn away from God to worship the false idols of the pagan nations, and they would be led off into captivity. They would repent and get their hearts right with God. God would restore them, and then they would start the cycle all over again. We get insight into the Babylonian way of life because Israel actually lived with them, even to the point of being forced to worship the Babylonian false gods. You know, how is our culture today like Babylonia? And how does our culture today want us to worship those false Babylonian gods? Is it through the theory of evolution that we can kick God out of our academic system and just teach that we evolved from ape-like creatures and that we're basically cousins to a banana and a tomato? Is it that it's okay to have abortions, which is the modern day version of when people used to sacrifice their children to the god Molech? Well, today we sacrifice children to the god Molech in, because we're not ready for responsibility. We want to continue partying and have pleasure. So we sacrifice our children for selfishness, for selfish reasons. That's a modern day idol. The, the, the religion of secular humanism that we're taught in school, modern day idol. These are all ways in which our society today is like Babylonia and wants us to worship their false gods. In the Bible, we find everything from wedding customs to funeral morning customs. Here in America, where I live, we get together for an afternoon, maybe an evening, to have a ceremony for a wedding. Whereas in Israel, they celebrate for weeks. Here, when somebody dies, we send a card, go to the funeral, gather at a relative's house for an hour or two to eat cold fried chicken and potato salad. There, people truly honor and mourn the dead for quite some time, and they talk about them regularly. 
they would even hire professional whalers to make a big to-do about the deceased so that people would understand that this person was really beloved. Yeah, they would hire professional whalers to go around going, oh, oh, oh. I could go on for days giving example after example of how the Hebrew scriptures bring us into the culture of the various times, situations, and stages of history in the ancient Near East. But this video should whet our appetite to realize what the Hebrew scriptures can teach us about their culture so that it can spur us on in our culture to read the Bible with fresh eyes. You know, that is really what I want this ministry to be all about is people getting into their Bibles and reading them with their families so that we can actually own what we believe and not just believe something because somebody told it to us. With the Bible as our authority, God's word over man's word. God will surely honor our appreciations of his dealings with people during those times as he works on us now in the time that we live. In conclusion, John chapter 4 verses 22 tells us, salvation is of the Jews. We may live in a different time and in another part of the world, but the Bible gives us the real history of our situation as humans. We today, like Israel, have to deal with pagan influences all around us. To be in the world but not part of the world can only be accomplished by God's empowerment or God's grace. There are two kinds of grace in the Bible. You know, just like God's, God's attributes are multifaceted, so is God's grace. There's the type of grace that is God's unmerited favor that he gives us. But there's also the type of grace that is God's empowerment. So in order to tell in the Bible what grace is referring to, whenever you come across the word grace in the Bible, I want you to substitute in unmerited favor or God's empowerment. Because you're going to see that the word God grace is used interchangeably. For example, the grace of God was upon Jesus. The unmerited favor was upon Jesus? No, the Father's empowerment was upon Jesus. So whenever you see the word grace in your Bibles, always substitute unmerited favor or God's empowerment to see what grace the Bible is talking about in that particular situation. So we must daily purpose in our hearts to keep our loyalty to the one who loves us, who gave his son for us, and who gave us this great book to explain everything that we need to know about our current situation as well as our future. Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button, subscribe to this channel, and I hope to see you in the next video.